Um, thank, thank you so much. Can you hear that? Is that good, or do I need to make that a bit louder? Is that fine? So thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'm, I'm, of course, uh, uh, excited to, to be here. Um, I have been struggling to start everything that I've tried to start, and even yesterday I, in class, couldn't start. Um, and so today I have no idea where to start, and I had some idea, um, and I think I might start with a film, um, which is a, is a pretty shocking little snippet, which comes from our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and which I think, ladies and gentlemen, will set the tone for not just Nelson Mandela's incarceration, because that, after all, is what we're going to talk about today, um, but also the tone for the country across the decades that Madiba was incarcerated. But actually, I don't think I'm going to start with that film, <laughs> because it would be impolite, I think, um, come to think of it, not to address some of the questions that have emerged. Um, and there is one in particular that I do want to address. Um, and then there were two others. One was about the ge geography of South Africa, what the political, the geopolitical setup, the provinces and so, for, so forth, what they, what they look like, what they were like and so forth. If I have time, I might get to that. Um, the other question, and thank you so much for these questions, was about my upbringing in South Africa and what it was like for me to grow up under apartheid and perhaps to reflect a little bit about, um, perhaps also personally, some of what I, what I experienced. Um, and again, um, that of course um, is something if we have time, I might, I might, I, I would happily do. Um, and then the third thing is the question that was, re that was raised in relation to the assassination attempt. So the assassination attempt on the architect of apartheid, Hendrik French Verwoerd. And so I say the assassination attempt because, of course, the one was an attempt and the other one was an actual assassination. And so um, the research that leads to the actual assassination was a, 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 a person by the name of Zafendas who um, murdered Verwoerd. And I have a bit of film. I, I might even show that today if we have time. Um, there was a film made about it, in fact, because Tzafendas was then put into a mental asylum for this, which wasn't a very pleasant thing to happen to him. Um, and the film is called The Furiosis. And I can't find the film. I would, I would like to see that film, in fact. Um, but be that as it may, the first assassination attempt, which is the one where we speculated about whether it was right-wing it, how could one be further to the right than for Wurt, um, which seemed a, an impossibility, and, and of course there were, and we can dwell in fact on what the nature of the far right was like, um, and I'll introduce you to some of the far right today if I have the time, um, was in fact an English farmer, David Pratt, who the first time tried to assassinate and wasn't successful in assassinating um, um, for Wurt, and which then, because of the, the, the unsuccessful nature of the attempt, it, it meant that for Wurt was deified. So we spoke about that, that he survived that attempt, and that indeed was part and parcel of the upsurge of Afrikaner nationalism, was the fact that he survived this attempt by David Pratt, who was an English-speaking farmer. And of course, when you speak about English-speaking and Afrikaans-speaking, um, you can immediately begin to see if, if it says in your mind that some are more liberal than others and that the English-speaking folk, generally speaking, were more towards the liberal side of the spectrum, then you can see that if it was an English-speaking farmer, that he wouldn't have been to the, to the right of, and indeed didn't agree with um, Favurt's uh, policies. Um, I've included a tract of, so I've, I've, I've written up almost a, a page of, of research on that particular person for you, and it will be available on the PowerPoints, so you can read up much more about, about Pratt. But I, I am running out of time. 
and 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 so I was thinking about that in fact the fact that I'm running out of time and I tried to find a philosophical reflection in relation to running out of time which I'd read somewhere and couldn't remember where I'd read it and so spent probably a few hours trying to give you the benefit of because once I you know then I have to I just have to you know I just have to find it and and it led me so I found a wonderful bibliography in a book by David Hofstadter called Gödel Escher Bach a fantastic book um, and and I'd originally thought it, this reference was in a in a book by Boole which was written with a title um, to do with the laws of thought so Boole thought he could spell out laws which governed thought but it wasn't in that and then I remembered that it was in Edward de Long's a profile of mathematical logic which <laughs> seemed to make sense to me because <laughs> It was when I read that book that there was this analogy with someone trying to do a biography and of course including the biographical effort, the autobiographical, shall I say, effort as part of the autobiography and that that analogy sat within the context of trying to understand infinity. And of course it was in this book that I had an epiphany I I'd, I'd, I'd tried to repeat it because when I looked at the formula and when I tried to understand what DeLong was saying about infinity, I literally had, had um, I mean a revelation perhaps, I felt it but could never replicate it again. I've tried to read that three or four times and could never repeat that feeling that I had. Um, and so I wanted to share with you the fact that not only am I running out of time but that of course Mandela ran out of time and yet it is impossible for us and even for him and for anyone else for that matter to record an entire lifetime and so in some respects I do owe you an apology for the for the superficiality of my endeavor um, and the fact that I'm trying to cram in so much into um, six short lectures and that I am very aware indeed of of the implications and what it means for us and, and what profound implications it, it, it does have if we think about um, things too deeply. I shall stop there um, because otherwise we could get on to all of that. We spoke about the storming of the World Trade Center and I found some footage. In fact, I was intrigued that I found two sets of footage, one which I was aware of and one which is racist propaganda, which is right-wing propaganda, which uses the same footage, but of course, as a propagandist would, then, you know, um, twists it. Um, and I'd almost been tempted to show that today as well, but the thing is, I literally don't have the time. Um, and so what I did want to show you and so there you will see a link right at the bottom if you can see it there's a link to a film about the assassination of Favurt and the story of Tzafendas is there um, and this particular overhead this this picture this slide is taken from a different series that I do on the negotiated settlement and how that played out how we negotiated peace in South Africa so there's a, a lecture series that I do on that particular subject and there's one subsequent to this which is all about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and how that functioned, what it did and um, how it played out across the two years that it did its, that it did its wonderful work. Um, all different sort of, of, of lecture series. Um, so I wanted to set the scene and I wanted to start with um, a film which I can't find now, which is such a pity. Um, there it is, there it is. And um, this short snippet of film is taken from our Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It isn't easy watching. If you don't want to watch it, I suggest you close your eyes and your ears. Um, and it represents but a small snippet, ladies and gentlemen, of the kinds of experiences that black people in South Africa were going through on a daily basis. So you'll hear evidence from one or two folk, evidence that was taken at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. 
and you should literally not think that it's that person alone that went through this experience, but that this was a commonplace experience if you ended up in a jail or if you were caught by the, by the security police. This entire series across two years was what we South Africans watched unfold on almost a weekly basis as it was broadcast on the public Truth and Reconciliation Commission is we said we would be transparent. It's one of the, one of the key differences between it and other endeavors of a similar nature is that we said we would open it up to the entire world to hear the story as it, as it unfolded. And of course, no one knew what the story was going to be. We, we literally had it in, in real time. And so this was broadcast along with all the other footage on the, on the public uh, uh, broadcasting uh, channel, the South African Broadcasting uh, Commission, the SABC. And if, if, if we could get the lights at the back that... Torture. How many times have you heard stories of South Africans who said they were tortured? And did you believe them? Well, this week, the Truth Commissioners and the public had no doubts as they sat in silent anguish, listening to testimonies of horror. Sinkokwana Malchas was sentenced to 14 years imprisonment in the 1960s. After his release, he was detained frequently and tortured on each occasion. His son died in detention after police poured acid over him. You have told us um, today that you were tortured uh, in many times in many different places. If you are able to, uh, and you, it's not too painful, could you describe some of that torture? What, what actually did they do to you? There is what they called the helicopter method of torturing. Torturing of some kind. They suffocated me by pulling a mask over my face. With the helicopter method, they put a stick behind your knees and you were hung upside down. Whilst this was happening, you were suffocated. It's fine. Don't, don't worry about it. That's all. Joe Jordan, now a member of the Eastern Cape uh, Provincial Legislature, was detained between 1986 and 1989. His back was damaged during torture by East London police. The chap who was there drinking beer. If I can estimate his weight, it was between 90 and 110 kilograms. He stood on my back with his boots and he started jumping. He continued jumping, and that's the person who injured my back. He must have jumped at least three times. And although I was tied up, I could feel that something was wrong. On Tuesday, four former commissioners of police, Generals Mike Heldenes, Johan Kutsia, Henny De Witt, and Johan van der Merwe, issued a statement claiming detainees were always treated according to strict regulations. And, and so there's a lot to say about, in fact, even that snippet, because there's behavior by the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, which became controversial. There are many aspects in relation to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and its functioning that we could talk about. But I wanted literally to start off by saying this was what you could expect if you ended up
being taken off the street. This is the kind of thing you could expect. And of course, they were still alive. So um, in many instances as well, you didn't escape um, with your life. Now, prisoner number 19476 of 62 went in to jail on the 7th of November 1962. He was sentenced to five years for leaving the country without a passport, and he was also sentenced for incitement. In the last lecture, I didn't have the opportunity to describe his travels through Africa, but that's what he got for doing that. Um, and he was transferred to Robben Island um, on the 27th of May, 1963. Shortly after that, in June, middle, middle of June, he was transferred back to Pretoria local prison, um, where he was then convicted of sabotage, along with a bunch of folk who had been implicated in, in acts of terror as a result of the police swooping on a farm known as Lily's Leaf Farm. And again, I don't have the time to go into all the detail about that um, e event um, and the implications of that event. So Mandela was already in jail when they found papers of his, to put it simply, in this house, which then meant that he was put on trial again. And the result of that trial, and the trial itself is an entire story, um, um, the result of that trial was his, his incarceration for life. Um, and that is then um, when he arrived on, on the 13th of June, 1964, where he got that famous number, 46664, which of course is the number that now is also used for fundraising and is generally the prison number that is associated with Mandela, but he didn't just have one number, he in fact had one, two, three, four, five such numbers, because in 1982 he was transferred to Polesmoor prison, and there he got the number 220, stroke 82, and then um, he was transferred finally to Victor Verster prison, um, and was given the number 1335, stroke 88. Now I start off this way because that gives you a grand picture of the, 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 the times that he spent in the various jails. Often people will think of 27 years, and indeed for those of you who go on the tour, they'll sometimes ask you, so how long was Ma Mandela on this island? Folk will say 27 years. He was, that was 18, so it was 27 in total. Um, now, I want to talk then about his experiences in, in jail. Um, but just before I do that, there's this, so, so when, when he traveled through Africa, he traveled on a, on a, under an alias, he traveled on a false passport, and he used this alias David Motsamai, he used this name. And once he was released, he wanted to go back to the place where the security police had shoved him off the road and grabbed him and taken him into jail. And I don't know, do, do, do you think we have the time potentially to watch that short snippet where he then g goes back and, he's, and he sort of reminisces about the fact that he was, I think the sound quality isn't that good, but let's see, let's see how we, how we do here. Um. Registered nurses provide patient care, health education, and emotional support for patients and families. RNZ a place of worship. Ironically, also a bastion of apartheid injustice. This is the historic old Pretoria Synagogue, converted into a special Supreme Court in 1952. It dealt with various cases relating to the anti-apartheid struggle. Fifty years to the day, Nelson Mandela was sentenced here to five years imprisonment for incitement and leaving the country illegally. 7th November 1962, a day etched in the country's collective consciousness. Three months earlier, he'd been trapped at a police roadblock in Tweedy. En route from Durban to Johannesburg, he'd been underground for 17 months, mobilizing funds and support for the MK. Years later, Madiba returned to the infamous site. Uh, this is the spot 
that uh, ended my freedom temporarily. Reliving the moment, his freedom was snipped short. I said, uh, my name is David Mutamai, <laughs> which uh, was my cover name. He then said, uh, are you not Mr. Mandela? I said, I have given you a name. He said, ah, you are Mr. Mandela, and that is Cecil William. You are under arrest. Fellow Ravonia trialist Ahmed Kathrada attended his trial. It was the, uh, the first trial of its nature where a, a senior leader is now charged after he's been underground for, for a long time. So in that, in that sense it was unique. Years on, the synagogue stands in virtual obscurity and bears little evidence of the events that led to a nation's long walk to freedom. Jillian Play, SABC News, Pretoria. So as his uh, biographer notes, and I quote from the biography, all the bright scenery and characters would contract for Mandela into the single bare stage of his cell and the communal courtyard, which is where they spent um, time. And if we think about the effect on Mandela, this is where Mandela then could stand back from himself, where he could see himself and could also reflect on how others indeed saw him. And as Samson notes, the letters, the prison records, and all the anecdotal, the ethnographic, if you like, uh, uh, recollections of Robben Islanders over the next 20 years serve as a, as a unique record of a number of things, but also what Samson refers to as the psychopolitics, where prisoners would ultimately come to dominate their guards. And so this myth that I'd like to dispel, which I often get asked is, so what happened? What was the impact of, of jail on, on Nelson Mandela? And some folk will say, well, it softened him and, and it made him change his mind and he became different because the Africana and because the National Party government managed to incarcerate him is exactly the, the opposite. And I hope that this lecture, if it does anything, demonstrates the extent to which that, in fact, is the case. You know, those of you who've seen the film, that the idea that there was a confrontation um, over a pair of trousers, over a pair of short trousers, is often one which is glamorized, um, and, and, and rightly so, because when Mandela got into, uh, onto Robben Island, one of the first things he did was confront his, his guards over the fact that he had to wear short pants, trousers. The only one of the folk who were incarcerated at the same time who got long trousers was Katrada. Why was that? Yeah, that's right, that's right, thank you. So, so Katrada was a so-called, so Katrada was Indian and the rest were black. If you were black, you were never a man, you were a boy. And because you were a boy, you wore short pants. You didn't wear long pants. Mandela did not like that. And one of the first things he said was, we want the same as, as, as everyone else. Now, when it comes to color-based disparities in, on Robben Island and indeed in some of the other jails, I can show you horrendous footage, in fact, even of the way in which food was prepared and the kinds of food that you got depending on your color. So basically what that boiled down to is if you were black on Robben Island, you didn't really get meat. Now, um, if you go on the tour, they show you the different menus for the different colors. And um, it is quite shocking to see how the sugar and the bread and other things are rationed out, of course, in ever diminishing quantities from Indian through colored through black. Yeah. And of course, white people weren't kept on, incarcerated on Robben Island. It was only for folk who weren't white. If you were white, you went to Pretoria. 
I don't tell this story well, ladies and gentlemen. If you go on the, on the, on the, on the tour with a former Robin Islander, that's when you get goosebumps, that's when you cry, that's when you begin to hear the authentic story from folk who really lived it. Um, so again, I just give you a an apology for secondhand news here, for, for a sort of a, a story of a story. Um, the prisoners and lawyers at that time together thought they, they would serve perhaps 10 years at the most and that international um, um, pressure in particular would get them out soon. In fact, as, as um, Samson notes on page 203, um, and I quote, the girls would be waiting for you in 10 years' time when you get out. Um, so they went in with that sort, of, that sort of mindset. They had no access to radio, no access to newspapers, and could at first only write and receive one letter of 500 words every six months. And of course, the letters were routinely confiscated and censored um, and, and withheld, obviously closely scrutinized. Now, of all the things that sustained them, the one thing that did sustain them was that they remained steadfast in the belief that their ideals were the right ideals. So they always believed in, in their ideals. The routine at the beginning was deliberately harsh. Cold showers, a bucket. So when I went on the tour the first time, I've done the tour three times, um, one of the, so, so the person who took me around said, the way in which it was sometimes referred to as having been, as having, sp as, uh, having spent time on Robben Island was that you ran with the buckets. And this was because in this small six by eight cell, all you had there was a f a two or three blankets on the floor and a bucket. And of course, the first thing you did in the morning was you had to run with that bucket to go and clean it. And so, it is said of Mandela and others, of course, that they ran with the buckets for 18 years. It's another way to look at spending time. In 1965, they began with the hard labor in the limestone quarry, which, of course, then is the cause for the fact that, so a lot of people say, I've heard it said of Mandela, that why is it that he can't cry? Why is it that you don't see tears coming out of Madiba's eyes. Um, and that's, of course, because he lost the ability to moisturize his eyes through hard labor in this, in this, in this quarry. Um, he was refused glasses for three years. And the glare, of course, if you go there, you know limestone is a whitish color. It's a, it's a, it's a, and, and, and it's a pretty interesting substance. So it impacted on him in, 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 that, in that fashion. Now, the, the way in which f folk were incarcerated at that time was that everyone was, was, was mixed up. All political prisoners were mixed, mixed together. And this had an interesting strategic implication, which it took the government 18 years to realize. Um, and so if you take the country's top resistance leadership of all political persuasions, and you stick them in one place together, I mean, you can imagine those great minds together, what they would start doing. Um, and so this gave Mandela um, um, a unique opportunity to explore other political perspectives. And of course, with other leaders, think about what, it, what, what change in South Africa meant. I quote, it was an extraordinary decision by the government to concentrate all political uh, 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 prisoners on the island. Mandela, in fact, thought it was the, one of the government's greatest mistakes because it allowed rival parties to find common ground. And in that single sentence, and in a few more snippets, I will be describing the groundwork that Mandela was putting in place for what happened on his release, 
because you can see if he's saying this is an opportunity for me to seek common ground with political parties, including the PAC, then you can see how he and other leaders were beginning to use this opportunity. Most of Mandela's colleagues automatically regarded him as a leader. There was this arrogance about him, apparently, that stemmed directly from his um, childhood as, 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 uh, in, a, in a regal sense and, and uh, having a chief as a father. Um, and, and as an aside, Samson notes that it was Walter Sisulu that often saved him from the consequences of that arrogance, um, because of course it would have some consequences. The, the folk who were incarcerated recreated their own ruling body on the island, mirroring the African National Congress's national executive. And indeed, one of the things that this policy-making body did was formulate policy in relation to the way in which political prisoners would interact with their warders. Um, this was, according to Mandela, a great problem. And, and the question, of course, was then how should they relate to warders who dominated them, dominated their daily lives, and indeed had the power to persecute them? Um, Mandela, though, because of his previous stints in jail, had, had, had realized that he could impress warders with a combination of assertiveness, respect, and his, and his substantive legal knowledge, and that he indeed could retain his dignity even in the most humiliating of circumstances. Um, and so, Samson writes of Mandela that one of his greatest traits was that he could respect warders as human beings, but he would never be subservient to them. And indeed, they were required to address their white warders as bas, which is the Afrikaans word for master, and he refused to do that. So in fact, Mandela understood that there was a raging debate even amongst warders, a significant debate amongst warders about how to treat political prisoners. And he was determined also to exploit that debate and insert himself in, in that debate and understand that there were warders who were potentially able to be turned, to be changed. And he said, and it's in his biography, that he recognized that when an Afrikaner changes, he changes completely. And so when an Afrikaner becomes a friend, he becomes a friend. That's on page 214 of the, of the biography. In fact, Walter Sisulu is saying that the origins of the negotiation process that occurred in the 90s can potentially be found in Mandela's attempts to persuade the Afrikaner warders of his policies and, 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 and the fact that the African National Congress's policies were the ones that, that were right. It is suggested that this helped him develop his own skills in negotiating with the Afrikaner. After about three and a half years, sort of from 1967, treatment began to improve, and treatment of prisoners was, um, according to Samson, relatively civilized and relatively relaxed. They could wear long trousers, everyone. They could wear jerseys. Um, is that a South African word? Jerseys. Possibly, because what do you call them? Sweaters. It's a British word, yeah. It's a British word, yeah. You call them jerseys. Could wear jerseys in the winter and could talk. They were allowed to talk in the quarry and they were allowed to talk in the courtyard. Um, but the fact that Mandela's ongoing representations in relation to conditions on the island um, 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 that he continued with these representations meant that in 1970 a new commanding officer was appointed, someone with a re reputation for brutality. And by the end of 1971, even Mandela's patience had been tested to the limit. 
But besides all of this, Mandela was seeing in the prison as a microcosm of the way in which South Africa could move, could move forward. Following this brutal reign of terror by this particular prison colonel, um, the, the, uh, the experience again changed and the Red Cross began to play a, a more significant role in life on, on the island and, and began to improve prisoners' conditions. And in fact, the balance of power changed because younger warders, some only, some only as young as 17, were much more open to the advances of Mandela and the others in relation to policy and conditions and so forth. Mandela, in fact, developed a special interest in the Afrikaner mindset. He specifically and specially and intentionally set out to understand, to understand the Afrikaner. He sought those conversations. He sought books. He wanted to understand. He wanted to understand what he called these ordinary men. His capacity for forgiveness always amazed his fellow prisoners. Um, and indeed, this was shared then and began to be shared by all who were incarcerated with him. For example, Ahmed Katrada is on record as saying, I grumbled and groused because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Um, and, and Bam, who was in prison, uh, 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 said, prison completely cured me of self-pity and of being self-centered. Mandela, so, so one of the things that, that folk did on, on, on the island was they created a, a university of their own. And they educated each other and other prisoners as best they could in relation to the subjects that they were able to uh, teach. And Mandela taught a course on political economy. Um, and he liked to trace the development of societies um, from feudalism through to uh, capitalism through to socialism. Um, and apparently his favorite method of teaching was the Socratic, Socratic method, so questioning, of course. Um, there is reference to the fact that people have sexual urges, and of course these folk are no different. And of the sexual urge, George Besos, who was the lawyer, African National Congress and who was a personal friend of Mandela's said that when they discussed this, that this was entirely sublimated into politics for the political prisoners, that is, and that the atmosphere of self-improvement and education helped political prisoners, and I quote from the text on page 235, helped them to overcome sexual strains and frustrations, which indeed caused ructions amongst the the common law, the common law prisoners. Now, another thing that Nelson Mandela and, and some of the folk who were incarcerated with him did was, of course, um, is write a book. And I think I brought it with once, and you've, you know of it, and some of you are reading it. And, and um, so a lot of this time that he had for reflection and analysis was used to write his autobiography. Um, and in fact, I have a picture here which I took probably three years ago. It just struck me now that I, so I didn't come, so I had this on my desktop. Um, and I know it looks just like a picture of some trees against a wall, because <laughs> that's really what it is. That's all it, all it is. Um, but it's taken inside the courtyard on, on, on Robben Island in, in sort of the summertime because there are leaves on those. And that was the only shade that you would find in that courtyard. Um, and the reason I took the picture is because sort of in that shade is where the book was buried. So of course he couldn't write that book. There was no way he was going to be allowed to write that book. There was no way he was going to be okay if he was found out to have been doing something like that. Um, and so if you're a revolutionary caught in a jail, 
and you're writing a, a, an autobiography, of course you need to hide it. <laughs> and so, so the idea of writing the book was that it would be published on his 60th birthday, which would have been in 1978, and would have, would have served primarily as an encouragement for the liberation movement, which was out of, of the country in exile. It was abroad. Every day Mandela was writing and passing 10 pages to a person by the name of Mac Maharaj, um, who then would be able to transcribe those pages into microscopic um, handwriting, apparently less, letters less than 0.5 millimeters high. I mean, I, I don't think I could see those letters. Um, and he did that, and then he hid these miniaturized sheets inside a book that he had on statistics planning to smuggle it out when his sentence ended in 1976. Katrada, Ahmed Katrada kept the original text and buried it in the courtyard. Now, um, the entire story of its discovery is of course one of those suspenseful stories which if we had the time we could tell in that style. Um, but the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, it was discovered. That wall wasn't the original high wall. It was different, or, and, and so it was being built by warders. And in order to build a wall, you have to build a foundation. When you dig a foundation, you dig up the ground. They found the manuscript. And this resulted in a loss of studying privileges for four years. No books, no newspapers, nothing, no, nothing that, of course now, you know, you, and you can imagine for yourself and, and uh, what that might be like, um, especially if you've started this structure on the island and you've got this university going, et cetera, et cetera. The book was ultimately smuggled out by Mac Maharaj, but it disappeared and remained unpublished until 1994. So I took that photograph because I, it's a kind of profound thing to think that the book that's on my bookshelf and that might be, you know, something you have was literally buried um, over there. And, and I've gone there three times now and every time I go there I make a point. I always go there in the winter so there are no leaves, but I always make a point of going there, right there. Whilst Mandela was incarcerated, he suffered two family tragedies. His, his eldest son by his first wife, Evelyn, was killed. Tembi was killed in a car crash in 1969, and this shook Mandela. Um, and and um, he lost his mother as well whilst he was, whilst he was incarcerated. Um, now... I, I want to talk about South Africa in the 80s, um, but perhaps before I do that, so, 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 so obviously Mandela was in jail through the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, and um, after 18 years on Robben Island, Mandela was told to pack up his things and head off to Polesmoor Prison, which is where a much more civilized treatment awaited him. Um, and, and, and people will then say, well, so why was he moved? And so I've given the answer in some respects because the government was finally realizing what it meant to have brilliant minds together in the way that they had them <laughs> together. Um, and um, there was a particular major, Major Harding, who had come to this conclusion and thought that the government had decided, uh, should decide that they had too much influence also on the other prisoners and ought to be isolated. So Mandela was, was, was taken um, in 82 to Polesmoor. Now in the 80s, I, I'm going to show you a short snippet of what South Africa looked like. Um, again, it's, it's not pleasant viewing. South Africa was a, was a cauldron of seething violence and political term, turmoil. An ungovernable 
South Africa heading towards civil war is what it looked like. And of course, coupled with this, the pressure internally and externally to release Mandela, this pressure was, was growing. Um, so, let me see if I can find, if I can find the snippet um, in my PowerPoint and show you that, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, the 80s. You can become a registered nurse by earning an associate degree in nursing, an ADN degree, in as little Let me also just say before I show this that this again comes from footage linked to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And um, it proved so popular in South Africa it was shown twice. What is expected of us? What should we do? We should defend our country in the best possible manner. Sergeant Baker's 
Anti-apartheid boycotts were spreading. Campaigns for disinvestment and sanctions became biting in their impact. And the cause of black South Africans in the 80s began to receive ever more publicity than before. Also through films and on stage, films such as Cry Freedom in 1987 and Serafina the year after in 1988, Mandela had become the world's most famous prisoner at this time. All the more romantic also because no one had seen his face. You weren't allowed to see his face. No new picture of him had been published since 1965. The icon of Mandela was free to develop as a symbol of heroic resistance to oppression, in, in fact quite independent of his physical reality. I pause, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm sure you have many questions after seeing that awful snippet, um, but I'm going to press on. Anti-apartheid campaigns in the West had done much to extend sanctions, including British and American um, um, sanctions, but the British and the American governments were reluctant to have a showdown with the Pretoria, with the South African regime, and were strongly influenced by the conservative lobbies at the time, which denounced the African National Congress as a terrorist movement. In 86, your American Congress voted 84-14 for a comprehensive sanctions bill imposing bans on new investment loans, airport landing rights, and oil. Um, Thatcher remained, Margaret Thatcher remained staunchly opposed to the African National Congress, but her senior diplomats had already begun putting out feelers to the senior folk in exile in the African, in the African National Cong Congress. The old Soviet menace, the USSR, the menace such as it was, was at that time rapidly evaporating. And after Gorbachev came to power in 85, he realized that the Soviet Union, and I quote, could no longer afford expensive adventures into, into Africa. There's a loss of appetite indeed also for violent revolution as required by classic Marxism. Um, and this was expressed both by the Soviets and indeed also then by the South African Communist Party and its leader at the time, Joe Slovo. Pretoria's rhetoric, the South African government's rhetoric at the time began to sound hollow. If you had to summarize its, 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 its rhetoric up to this point, it was, we fear the red danger, communism, and the black danger, black, uh, black South Africans. And these black and red dangers were beginning to sound hollow at the time. Um, although, of course, Reagan and Thatcher at that time continued to play on the communist bogey, um, which encouraged the South African government's recklessness um, and certainly scared off Western businessmen and politicians from contact, from making direct contact with the African National Con uh, 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 Congress. But this non-contact was actually nonsense because in some respects it wasn't as complete as it seemed. And certainly when I was a young boy growing up in South Africa, it was, it, it was anathema, it, it was not considered possible to have any interaction 
with the African National Congress. It was not even something you thought was potentially even possible. So whilst Boerter, uh, the Prime Minister at the time, and Thatcher kept up their attacks on the communist revolutionaries, there were some enterprising non-profits, some enterprising capitalist ventures, some enterprising academics, and some enterprising individuals who were building so-called secret bridges which were aimed at changing the political scene. Now, I might just want to reflect on three or four or five of those, and I'll do that as briefly as I can. And of course, we're heading towards his release. So, so, his, so the next lecture, did I say this was the penultimate lecture when I started? You see, there were so many ways to start, and that was one of them. <laughs> I was going to say, well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the penultimate lecture, and we are heading towards um, Mandela, the president, Mandela, the great reconciler, um, and, and his release from prison. In any event, there were some secret discussions that were happening in South Africa that were attempting to pave various paths towards a peaceful settlement. One of those was a foundation which is located in New York City, the Ford Foundation, which had a black president at the time, Franklin Thomas, and in June 1986, he arranged a discreet meeting between Afrikaners and Congress leaders. Now, there's an interesting thing about Afrikaners is that they had a secret organization called Die Bruderbond, which means band of brothers or, or brother band. And this secret organization was the intellectual heart of Africana ideology. And um, members of this brother band were part of the folk who um, um, uh, met with the African National Congress in 86 under the auspices, if you like, of the Ford Foundation. The understanding that Thabo Mbeki, who was later to become a president in South Africa, that he had of this meeting was that if it did anything, it normalized the perception that members, I got stuck for a word there at a, for, for a moment, and I'll tell you why, that members of the African National Congress were human beings. It normalized that perception through that interaction. I got stuck on the, on the word because I was going to say human beings belonging to the ANC, but that didn't work in that sentence. The second one was a prominent South African white politician, Frederick van Sale Slubbert, who was the a former leader of the opposition and indeed then left Parliament in 1986 after calling publicly for a negotiated settlement at that time and in 87 organized a meeting in Dakar, Senegal with 50 Afrikaner intellectuals. These Afrikaner intellectuals issued a communique asking for a negotiated settlement and calling for the unbanning of the ANC. And I vaguely remember that there was huge fury and outcry over the fact that, that Van Sale had done this. Um, and, and, and Boerter, the Prime Minister, reacted in fury over the fact that this had occurred. But in secret, his own National Intelligence Service had assisted, in fact, in brokering that meeting. Hindsight is an interesting thing. And, and we have more to say about the National Intelligence Service. Um, and I leave it for you to form a value judgment although I may not mince my words about them either when I get to that. Cecil Rhodes Old Mining Company Goldfields played a role, a significant role, in brokering and opening up the path for negotiations. Um, there's a film about this, a really excellent film, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to watch something that's gripping and, and good to watch, and at the same time, factually pretty accurate it's called end game and have you seen it yeah there's some nodding yeah some folk may have heard of it or seen it um, 
I use it in class too when we talk about the anatomy of a negotiated settlement and we look at some of the factors that paved the way for the peace process to, to occur, then that film is quite good in relation to a lot of the aspects that it pulls out that opened up the way for discussions. And it, so it depicts, a, a, you know, Michael Young, uh, a, a Goldfields employee, bringing the ANC together with the Afrikaner, um, um, a group of Afrikaner intellectuals. Um, and in fact, that, lasted two years and established trust between the ANC and this group of, of intellectuals who, as you will see if you see the film as well, included F.W. de Klerk's brother, de Klerk being the last white. I don't know if I should say it like that because, you know, if we don't want to talk about color anymore, then it's wrong to say that, isn't it? Um, but certainly the last apartheid white president. How about that? Um, In my mind, one of the most significant secret processes was Mandela's own request for talks. Mandela um, um, invited the Minister of Justice at the time, Kurbi Kutsia, in 1987 to begin a process of talks. Um, and Kurbi Kutsia responded to Mandela's call by inviting him to his official residence where they met. The meeting was kept secret from most everyone, including Mandela's fellow <coughs> prisoners in Polsmoor at the time. And so there, were, there, there was a series of meetings with Mandela in jail, and I want to, if I have the time, focus a little bit on, on those meetings. So, so Mandela was, was transferred to Polsmoor prison. He went there with Sisulu, with Mklaba, Ray Mklaba and others, and was joined by Katrada as well, and Samson refers to this as the beginning of Mandela's loneliest stretch. He was facing the government alone, knowing that they were trying to split him off from his colleagues, and in fact, he couldn't entirely come clean with his colleagues either. He couldn't divulge because these were secret discussions, even to some of his closest friends and allies, that he was engaged in these discussions which his biographer talks about as intricate talks which were interlocked with other talks that were going on as we've described um, and, and of which he in turn could not be properly informed. So there were multiple processes, secret processes occurring, all clandestine and all aimed at achieving one thing or another. Um, Even Tambo, in fact, Oliver Tambo, whom he had a close relationship with, seemed shaken. T Tambo was in Lusaka at the time. And it was only because of the strong relationship between Mandela and Tambo that Tambo was able to keep the party together in relation to the fact that some of this had leaked out that Mandela was talking to the government. And you can imagine how his constituencies might have felt about that and how they might have seen him potentially as saying, well, are you selling us out? Why are you talking to them? So late in 1987, Mandela and, and Kutsia, mm -hmm. the Minister of Justice, began a, a, a serious series of discussions, including two people, one who was the Director General of the Prison Service and one who was the Director General of the National Intelligence Service. Um, and in fact, the National Intelligence Service, it turns out, had already made contact with the ANC in 1984. Mandela wasn't excited by the fact that this particular person, Barnard, Neil Barnard, was joining the talks. He didn't like that idea. Um, he felt it would be raising the stakes. But he knew that the Director General had the ear of the President and that was Mandela's target. He wanted to get to the president. That was where he knew he could make a difference. So <clears throat> whilst this is all happening, the African National Congress, of course, hears about potential negotiated settlements and negotiated initiatives, and in 87 produces a document called Possible Responses to Initiatives Around Negotiation. 
Tambo was getting concerned about these discussions and smuggled a secret message into jail asking Mandela what he was up to, what, what was going on. Mandela managed to get a reply to Tambo and the reply said um, the time had come to be strong. Um, and so Mandela met this team from the government from May 1988, almost once a week over the following months, sometimes for up to seven hours at a time, he was engaging with, this, with these four white government representatives. Barnard, of course, was the great government mastermind, the intelligence director general, and Mandela was very surprised at his misconceptions about the African National Congress, which of course he had gleaned from, as Mandela puts it, biased police and intelligence files. They went over the same arguments, Mandela and Barnard, arguing back and forth. Mandela needed to renounce violence. That was Barnard's mantra. It was the president's mantra at the time. You must renounce violence. And Mandela had a simple reply. He said the state must renounce violence because the state started the violence. They went over the question of nationalization and communist control of the African National Congress. Mandela refuted that um, and, and, and was at pains to point out that there was, this was a spurious relationship, as he had done in court all those years back. Inside South Africa, we knew nothing. The public knew nothing of these secret talks or the activities of the real Mandela who was seeking a negotiated settlement. All you had in the public's mind was a demon, a demonized image, a mythological demon, or, of course, a hero, a hero of the struggle. So depending on whether you were white or black, you would either see him as you know, the Antichrist or a hero. Um, but his name began creeping back into the headlines, and indeed a newspaper, which I love to read, because it came out on a Fridays, and for a political scientist it was a great read, was the Weekly Mail and Guardian. Um, and it still remains a great paper to this day. Changed the law by producing a picture um, of, or reproducing a picture of Mandela, which the government itself had produced in a propaganda booklet of its own. Um, um, so, so the challenges were beginning to become much more open. Mandela's international fame at this point was enhanced, of course, by the fact that he turned 70. Um, and the BBC was excited. The British Broadcasting Corporation was excited by this. They wanted to televise a Wembley Stadium rock concert. And despite criticism from the Tories, it went ahead. And indeed, what surfaced there? Well, a smuggled message from Nelson Mandela made it to that rock concert you can you can only imagine um, I have a film I have a film but it's too long for now um, and and of course I'm going to give you all of this um, so you if you want to see a little bit of um, footage it's there for when you have them when you have the time Mandela did get sick he became he, he, he had pneumonia and the government realized that at that time well, they got a huge fright because the only thing um, worse than a free Mandela for them apparently was a dead Mandela. Um, all of a sudden, you know, they realized that it would be a catastrophe if he died. And so on the 7th of December 1988, he was transferred to Victor Fester prison. And he became prisoner number 1335 of 88. So he went into what... Samson talks about as a halfway house. He would be in a halfway house between prison and freedom. It literally was a house. It is a house. It's not open to the public. Um, but I have had the privilege of going into it. I didn't jump up and down on his bed. I, I, didn't, I didn't sit at his dining room table. Um, but I wandered through the house with a few folk. Um, and so it's a three or four bedroomed house with a swimming pool, um, place to barbecue, um, nice kitchen, etc. Um, great view of the mountains. 
And so he was transferred to this house. Um, And it is in this house that um, he was being prepared for freedom. His long secret talks with the government were continuing, um, and, and the argument over renouncing violence and renouncing communism and abandoning um, these perspectives continued. In fact, not only were these sticking points, but Neil Barnard insisted also that there should not, so there shouldn't only be a break with a communist party, but there should be a complete and comprehensive break with the idea of majority rule, with the principle of the popular vote and majority rule. This last point remained a, a sticking point, even through our negotiated transition, it, it remained a, a, a sticking point. Was Mandela selling out? Black constituencies were hugely worried about the fact that Mandela might be selling out at this time. Communications was a huge problem. I think I'm running out of time. Um, there was a secret link set up between Mandela in this house and the African National Congress leadership outside in Lusaka. And it was set up by none other than the man who had done that m microscopic writing, Mac Maharaj, who had set up this computer link Mac, Mac, yeah, was a, he was good at things like that. Uh, um, he was good at interesting things. Um, I, I guess I will, I will say this then, uh, by way of closing, that the entire endeavor from the government side in relation to these conversations and these discussions and these um, moves into ever more comfortable circumstances for Mandela, were attempts by the government to split Mandela away from his constituencies, to bring Mandela into the fold as was the classic with, coloni with the coloni uh, colonial uh, attempts to divide and rule and indeed Afrikaner attempts to divide and rule. It was the opportunity they thought, if they had him on their side, to have someone who could speak in the way that they might like someone to speak, someone of his stature. He did not, he did not give in to any of that. He continued to the end to insist on what he believed to be right, right until, until the end. Um, and so I think, I think on that good note, I shall thank you. I, I didn't leave any time for q and I'm sorry about that next one. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.